Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan, and uh, if you're going to get to know me, there's three important things you got to know. Uh, number one, the living Jesus has radically transformed my life. I would not be standing in front of you here today if it wasn't for him. Jesus changed everything for me. Uh, number two, I'm married uh, to lo my lovely wife, Taylor. Uh, we've been married for seven and a half years. We have one son. His name is Jude and a daughter on the way. And we're going to name her Lucy. So we're really excited about that. And uh, the third important thing that you got to know about me is that I am not special. Uh, people always misunderstand me when I say that. Here's what I mean. Sometimes we think about the people who stand on stages as more important than all the rest. But that's just not true. And I believe that God desires to use you in the same way that he uses me. And you may never stand on a stage and you may never preach to some place overseas somewhere. But I believe that God has a special and intentional purpose for you. You know, uh, not too long ago, I was sitting in a massive international airport in Thailand. And uh, I, am, <laughs> I travel a lot overseas, and I'm always trying to save money, <laughs> which means that I often end up buying the ticket that has the longest layover. And in this case, I had 12 hours overnight in Thailand. And so there's no like going out and exploring. So I decided I would just sit in the airport. And as I did, I began to just people watch. And you know, jet lag has me wired wide awake, so I'm people watching, people going left and right. And the more I watched, the more my heart began to grow burdened. And I realized that these people are coming from places and going to places where they may never hear the good news of Jesus. And my heart began to grow burdened, and I thought to myself, man, what can I do? And I thought, you know, well, maybe, maybe I could stand on a chair in the middle of this airport, and I could preach so that all of them could hear the, the good news of Jesus. And I realized it's probably not the most effective method, you know, like in an airport in a different country, overseas, like if I got kicked out of the airport, that would be a really bad thing. I don't know how I'm going to get home. And like on top of that, many, everybody's busy. You know how people are in airports. They're trying to get from A to B and uh, maybe they hear only a little bit of the message. And I, you know, the, the, there was a, a million reasons that wouldn't work. And I realized in that moment, they didn't need some preacher from a stage. What they needed was someone who would be willing, sorry, Ed, I know. What they needed was someone who would be willing to get up close, to get nearby, someone who would be willing to learn their name, someone who knew their language and could share the gospel in a way that they could understand. They didn't need a preacher. They needed a friend. And uh, I looked at all of these people, and I thought to myself, well, maybe I could do that for a few, but there's thousands and thousands of people walking in front of me. There's more people needed. There's more people needed. And Jesus faced a really similar, interesting, similar paradigm uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bible, uh, you can flip to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Here's what it says. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. All right, so it's a very uh, simple passage. Here's what, what, what's going on. Jesus is traveling through all the places, right? All the towns and villages. He's preaching in their synagogues, healing every disease and affliction. And he looks out on all the people, all the needs of the people. You can just imagine them. There's hungry people. There's sick people. There's people who are falsely imprisoned. There's, there's slaves. There's all kinds of, all the needs of the people. And he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers 
are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. And then if you were to keep reading in Matthew chapter 10, which comes directly after, you would see that the very people he's talking to, the disciples, he sends them out almost as if to say the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And oh, by the way, that's you guys. (laughs) Why did Jesus use the word laborer? It's kind of an interesting one. When you think of the word laborer, my guess is that you don't think of someone who has like a really high education level. You probably don't think of somebody who has a very specific, high-level skill set. My guess is that you think of an ordinary person. When I think of the word laborer, for instance, I think of someone who might dig a trench, or rake some leaves, or do something that anybody can do. I believe that Jesus used the word laborer on purpose. Because he wasn't trying to say, the harvest is plentiful, but the church leaders are few. And he wasn't trying to say, the harvest is plentiful, but the missionaries are few. Or the harvest is plentiful, and the very skilled musicians are few. No, no. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few. The ordinary people, the everyday people, the any Christian person who's willing to carry my message, those people are few. His heart was burdened, filled with compassion, and his answer to all of the needs, the hunger and the sickness and the slavery and and, and the falsely imprisoned and all, all of the things that he would have looked and seen in the ancient world, his answer to all of that was not, we need more Pastors, uh, listen, don't hear me wrong. I love pastors. You have an amazing pastor. I, had, I got the opportunity to have coffee with him. What a great guy. Isn't he awesome? Yes, he's an awesome guy. And I, I, I got to be introduced to some of the people who help you run this on a Sunday morning. They're great, amazing people. I, I love pastors. I love missionaries. Some might even say that I am one. But, like, you, you got to understand the needs of the kingdom are too expansive for just a few leaders to do them. Here's the statistics. Spiritually speaking, about 6% of you in this room would be gifted leaders. Who's been told your whole life, you can be a leader too? There's this massive movement. Like it started when I was in like fourth grade. You're a leader. (laughs) Uh, Actually, I'm not. (laughs) I'm a teacher, that's what I'm good at. I'm not a leader, and that's okay. And maybe you're sitting in this room right now and you're thinking, man, I'm also not a leader. That's okay. God still wants to use you. Here's the numbers. As of recently, there are about eight billion people on planet Earth, yeah? That's a lot of people, eight billion people. About 2.2 billion of them claim to be Christians. We all know that that number is a lot less, but for the sake of the numbers, let's just say it's 2.2 billion. This leaves 5.8 billion people on planet Earth today who don't know Jesus. That is an incredibly large number. I don't know about any of you, but when I think about numbers, it's usually tens and twenties and hundreds and thousands. I, I very rarely think in terms of billions. But let's make the number a little bit smaller. 3.3, 3.3 billion. That's the number of people who woke up this morning, today, right now, who, if they had had a dream of Jesus last night, let's just say, for example, there would be no one to tell them who Jesus is. 3.3 billion people on planet Earth today who have little to no access to the gospel, little to no access to Jesus in any way, no pastor, no missionary. If there is a missionary, it's like one on like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. It's insane. They have little to no access to the word of God. It's not in their language. Meanwhile, we have the word of God in like 20 different English translations, and it just sits on our shelves, and we don't read it, but they don't even have access to it. So 3.3 billion Here's what that number breaks down to. If you were to stack them foot to shoulder, 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 you would be able to get from the earth to the moon and back six and a half times, 13 lengths. That's the number of people on planet earth today. That's not people who have rejected Jesus. That's not people who have heard the gospel and said, "Uh, I don't find it very compelling. 
That's the number of people on planet Earth today who have never even had a chance. If I was to try to preach to 10,000 of them per week, which I'm not, but if I was to try 10,000 a week, it wouldn't take me just one lifetime to preach to all of them, or two, or five, or 10. It would take me 100 lifetimes, 6,300 years, to preach to all 3.3 billion people just one time. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This is why Jesus said the laborers are few and not the leaders. Because if we rely only on leaders, the work will never be done. People will live their whole lives and die without ever hearing the good news of Jesus. And you and I both know that our country is increasingly becoming that way. I have a neighbor in his late 40s who, for the first time ever, heard the gospel from me just a, a year ago. They're not just all around the world. They're right here in our own backyard. I have a friend named Ahmed. I was just with him in Egypt. Uh, oh, I can't say the country. You guys already know what it is, though. I was just with him in the Arab world. And uh, we were there a couple weeks ago. We brought together believers from all across North Africa and the Middle East, and we were doing a training for them uh, so that they could take it back to their home congregations and use it, Lord willing, uh, to advance the kingdom in, in very difficult and dangerous places. And Ahmed told me his story. He said, I grew up Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family. And as a Muslim, I was taught that Christians are garbage. These are his words, that they smell bad, that they look bad, that they're cor morally corrupt human beings. And me and my 11 brothers and sisters lived in an apartment building in one of the most restricted nations on earth. And it just so happened that a Christian family moved in next door to us. And uh, my parents told me, don't even look at those people. If they say, say hello to you, do not say hello back. But over time, my heart began to grow soft. Like, it's just common human decency. These people are so nice to me. Like, maybe they're hiding something, I don't know. But like, they seem so nice. And slowly, 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 this family builds a relationship with my friend. And eventually, he, uh, he hangs out with their kids. And they're hanging out. And he's like, man, these kids seem just like us. They don't seem like garbage people. And then these kids finally talk him into coming into their apartment and sitting with the mom. The mom of this family, this Christian family, loved Ahmed better than his own mother, is what he said. I lived in a, he said, I lived in a family of 11 kids. They never celebrated my birthday. But this woman made me a birthday cake. I felt so loved and so cared for. And this piqued his interest. For a couple of weeks, he was trying to see if it was OK. And, and eventually, he, he finally asked the question. He said, hey, tell me about this Christianity thing. And they did. They, they shared what limited information they could with him to keep him safe. Because they knew that if he decided to follow Jesus, it was a death sentence. So they shared limited information with him. But this, it, it stuck with him. It, he had experienced this incredible amount of love. He had heard bits and pieces of the message of Jesus. And this led him to think, oh man, I, I, I'm really interested in this. This family moves away before he can get very much more information out of them. And then his family moves back to their home country, which is another restricted nation, but not so bad. And Ahmed says, you know, I'm going to purposely get jobs where I can be exposed to Christians, to outsiders coming into my country. So he works for tourism boards, and he works for education systems, and he works for all these people. And for 20 years, 
He tries to get the information that he needs in order to follow Jesus. For 20 years, he meets hundreds and hundreds of Christians. And you know what these people do? Nothing. They don't do anything. They say, oh, yeah, I know a little bit about that. I can send you a book. He says the books never came. All of these ordinary people, these ordinary Christians who said, yeah, I'm a Christian, were traveling to this country, and there was a man in this country born Muslim who was hungry to hear about Jesus, and nobody could tell him. Finally, after 20 years, he gets connected with this elderly couple, and for three years from that point, he asks, and he says in his own word, I asked literally 6,000 questions over the course of three years. And finally, he decided to follow Jesus. It came at a great cost. His wife left him. He was ostracized from his community. But for him, he says, it doesn't even matter because Jesus is real. I want to just pull two things out of this story really quickly for you. The, the person that piqued this man's interest was not some, some famous person standing on a stage. And it wasn't a highly skilled musician. It was an ordinary mom who just loved him better than his own mother. And then there was this incredible shortage of people who would do the same. For 20 years, an incredible shortage. And finally, he found an, another ordinary couple who would tell him about Jesus. We think to ourselves, uh, I know you guys have been studying evangelism a lot. How's that going, by the way? Is it good? How's it been? Good? Anybody been able to use uh, some of the stuff that you've been learning? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, awesome. Cool. I have an encouragement for all of you. The Christian life is very boring until you take Jesus seriously at his word and Get out there. I say that with humility and gentleness in my heart, but like if, if the beginning and end of your Christian life is in this room, I would imagine you're incredibly bored. <laughs> but Jesus is not boring. <laughs> Jesus is inviting you on the most epic adventure of your life. And it doesn't matter if you're a little kid, like a teenager, or if, you're, if you got gray hair, it don't matter. He's inviting you on the most epic adventure of your life. And if, if you want to see the things that you read about in the book of Acts, if you want to see the living God at work in the lives of people, try opening, your, try opening your mouth out there. Try loving people out there, and you'll see it happen. So, Jesus says there's this enormous need for more laborers. Laborers are ordinary people. Not the leaders, but the ordinary people. And the reason that there is a need for so many laborers is because there's an enormous need of people out there who have no idea who Jesus is. And here's what laborers do. They do just a couple of very basic things. The first thing that they do, uh, would you guys mind raising your hand up in there as high as you can get it for me? As high as you can get it. As high as you can get it. I'm holding my shirt down so I don't offend anybody. As high as you can get it. As high as you can get it. Can anybody get it any higher? Any higher? Any higher? Please. Any higher. That's it? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. All right. And, and if it wasn't disrespectful, we might stand on the chairs or something, right? Like, I get it. When we talk about loving God, I think this is what Jesus is looking for. Hey, can I, can I love him a little bit more? 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 But for many of us, we kind of decide, we've decided a long time ago that we're going to just kind of put in the bare minimum. Like, Jesus, I love you. But I, there's a limit. Like, my love for you does not exceed a certain threshold. But that's not the way that the, the Bible talks about following Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, Paul, after explaining everything that Jesus has done, he says, offer your bodies, therefore, as living sacrifices this is your act of worship. If any of you guys know anything about sacrifices, then you know that a sacrifice is something that has to die, 
right? And uh, so a living sacrifice, that's kind of a, a contradiction. How, how can something be a living sacrifice? Well, it's someone who has decided, I'm going to lay down my life and my hopes and my dreams and my comforts and everything that I am for Jesus. I'm going to die to myself daily for the sake of the Lord. Here's how that might look physically. I think many of us are in this posture before the Lord. We've said, Jesus, Sunday mornings, that's all you, bro. You can have my eternity. Thank you for saving me. Like, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But I believe that this is what he's looking for. He's looking for this. Everything I am. All my words. Every breath. Every action. My money, not just 10%. Jesus, all of it is yours. Tell me how to use it. My time, not just Sunday mornings, all of it is yours. I think that's what Jesus is asking for. Not that you're earning your salvation. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not preaching a works-based gospel. You are saved by grace. Don't try to earn your salvation. You can't. Jesus' love for you is unconditional. The question is, what is your love for him? I think for many of us, it's conditional. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and you will produce fruit, but apart from me you can do nothing. John chapter 15. Let's break it down. Jesus says, I'm the vine, I'm the trunk, you're the branches. Abide in me, which is an old English word for hang out with me, spend time with me, be up close to me, and you will produce fruit. And that's something that many of us have heard. Raise your hand if you've heard that scripture before. Hallelujah, you read your Bibles. All right, good. All right, so abide in me and you will produce fruit. That's something that we're all very familiar with. But we always forget the second part of the verse. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Not apart from me, you can do 10%. Not apart from me, you can do 50%. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think the reason that many of us are unable to have the courage or, 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 the, or the willingness or the wisdom to go out into the world and, and share the love of Jesus with our friends, neighbors, coworkers, you name it, is because we're not abiding in the vine. We're not up close. We're not nearby. We've decided, Jesus, you are restricted to this specific paradigm, this Sunday morning paradigm, and that's it. But he wants every part. If you want to see your life produce fruit, it starts with abiding in the vine. Listen, my own story, man, I wish I had like five hours, but I don't. All right. In my own story, I thought that I had to be the one to save people. I thought I had to be the one to pick myself up by my bootstraps and be the perfect Christian and do all the right stuff. I thought that that was who I was supposed to be. But I realized through experience with the Lord that it wasn't me. When I say that the living Jesus radically transformed everything for me, here's what I mean. I mean that one night when I was so desperate and so alone and so contemplating ending it all, Jesus reached his hand into my life after I asked him to, and it's as if he turned on rivers of living water that he talks about in John chapter 4. It wasn't something that I did for myself. It wasn't something that I just willed myself to do. Hey, I'm going to be the best Christian today. I'm, going to wait. I'm just going to wake up today and be the best one. No, 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 no. Jesus changed everything for me. If you abide in the vine, you will produce fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is the first thing that laborers do. They love God with everything. Then... The second thing that they do, hey, thanks for raising your hand. That was so cute. Really appreciate that. All right. The second thing that they do is they love others. Jesus, Jesus made this clear, right? He said, what is the greatest command? Love God, love others. All right. So he loved, love others. Here's the question. Who are the others that we're supposed to love? You know, someone, Jesus told us a story about this once. He said, you know, there was this person, and <laughs> they were walking on the road, and they, they got uh, robbed, and, and these religious people walked by, and, and they weren't very good to them. And then the Samaritan, who's an enemy, walked by, and he helped him and put him on his donkey and took him and paid for his room and paid for We all know that story, the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus taught us from that story that whoever I'm up close to, that person is my neighbor. So right now... This wonderful lady is my neighbor. 
Or right now, these two are my neighbors. Or right now, this guy's my neighbor. You guys get it. Right now, this, the, this wonderful section, these people are my neighbors. Wherever my feet go, those people are my neighbors. Let me ask. For those of you who I, just, I was just really nearby, was that awkward for you a little bit? No? Okay. Did you feel like my words had a greater impact when I was closer to you? Maybe a little. We think that I have to, in order to do ministry, I need to have a stage. No, no, no. Jesus shows us time and time and time again in the scriptures that the most impactful moments are the moments that he gets up close to somebody, that he gets nearby to them. Just take a second and think about your favorite story in the scriptures. Think about it. What's your favorite story of Jesus in the scriptures? Favorite story of Jesus in the scriptures? Maybe when he heals blind Bartimaeus, son of David, have mercy on me. Or when the woman reaches out and touches the hem of his cloak, oh, I felt power go out of me. Or when he feeds the 5,000, just think about it. I'm willing to bet that your favorite story depicts Jesus up close to somebody. If you want to impress people, you will impress people up here. But if you want to impact people, you'll impact them up close. It's not very complicated. We make evangelism way more complicated than it needs to be. People come up to me and they say, Nathan, I don't have all the answers. And I'm like, yeah, me neither. <laughs> Do you have Jesus? Do you have what Jesus has done for you? Just tell them that. Do you know the gospel? I hope you do. Share that. Well, what if they have a question I can't answer? Oh, it's okay. I don't know the answer, but I can figure it out for you. Can I have your phone number? I'll get back to you right away. <laughs> Let me ask someone who does know. I'll get you that answer as soon as possible. Well, Nathan, I I'm not very good at talking to people. Okay. I understand. I'm the most awkward person to ever walk the earth. When I walk into a room full of strangers, I want to disappear into the corner. And nobody ever believes me when I say that because they're like, well, you stand on stages. This is a controlled environment. This is a one-way conversation. Like, this is very easy. Person-to-person -person conversation, I get it. It's very difficult. But Jesus didn't say following him was going to be easy. He, he told us that it would come with challenges and difficulties. And let me tell you, the difficulties that you face is nothing compared to the difficulties that our brothers and sisters around the world are facing. I, I, I got to be honest with you guys. I know that we're experiencing an increased level of persecution, but it's nothing compared to being thrown into prison and having your life threatened because you decided to open your mouth for Jesus in a public place. It's going to be a little bit challenging. But remember, if you abide in the vine, you will produce fruit. It's going to happen. The closer you get to Jesus, the more time you spend with him, the more time you spend in your Bible, you're going to produce fruit. It will happen. Love your neighbors. Uh, flip with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Nope, Luke chapter 19. I'm also a little bit dyslexic. All right. Discalculatic. All right, Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin in verse 1. Actually, I'm having you flip, your, uh, flip in your Bible to that scripture just so that you know that I'm not lying. But we're going to tell this story together because you guys all know it from, the, from your heart. You know it, I know. All right, so in this story, there's a, a story about a very short man. Anybody know? Zacchaeus, yes. Thank you very much. And Jesus is traveling through Jericho. And the Bible says that there's a man there called Zacchaeus, and it says two things about him. The first is that he is short, and the second is that chief tax collector. Whew. You guys all know about tax collectors. I'm sure you've been preached at a thousand times about tax collectors. These guys were hated and despised by everyone. Think about it this way. America gets taken over by China. And China says, we're going to levy taxes against Americans. And one of your American friends decides they're going to collect taxes on behalf of China. How are you going to feel about that person? 
No, you are not going to like that person. That's, that's the situation of Zacchaeus. All right. So Zacchaeus is a wee little man, and he climbs up into a sycamore fig tree. I looked up these trees once. They, they have big old long leaves. I don't know if it, I, I think it was like springtime when Jesus was walking through because he's on his way towards Jerusalem for his crucifixion at this point. So maybe it's like springish time. Maybe it would have been very difficult for Jesus to see, see Zacchaeus in the tree. But, but we know that he... We know that he what? We, Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the tree. So Jesus is walking through Jericho. He sees Zacchaeus in the tree. What does he say? Come on down, Zacchaeus. We're going to spend some time together today. That must have been epic. We don't, the Bible doesn't actually say what they did that day. It doesn't say if they had coffee or chicken nuggets or if they drank tea or I don't know. It doesn't say. What we do know is that as a direct result of Jesus being up close to Zacchaeus in that moment, Zacchaeus' whole life is radically transformed. Remember, Zacchaeus has traded everything in his life at this point for money. Everything. Money is his God. He's traded membership with his people. He's traded, like, being treated well. He's, tr he's traded everything in his life for money. And then in an instant, he says, Jesus, half of, half of my money, I'm just going to give it away. Oh, and by the way, which is highly likely that he did, by the way, if I've stolen anything from anybody, I'm going to return it fourfold. If I stole one goat, I'm giving back four goats. After being up close to Jesus, it's as if money didn't matter as much anymore. Isn't that interesting? Jesus shows us how to be laborers in this passage, and uh, this is a pattern that occurs over and over and over and over again in the scriptures. And my friend Matt, he preached here not too long ago, and I think he told you these three things, but I think they bear repeating, because remember, we think, when we think about evangelism, we make it way more complicated than it needs to be. When we look at what Jesus actually did, when we look at Jesus' model of evangelism, all he did was these three things over and over and over and over and over again. Here's the first thing that he did. He saw people. Have you ever been surrounded by people but also simultaneously felt totally invisible? Raise your hand if that's been you. Amen, hallelujah, me too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean amen, hallelujah. I just meant me too. I've been there. Imagine all of the people in your day-to-day -day life, especially, I don't have my cell phone on me, especially in this hyper cell phone world that we live in where everybody's kind of stuck in their own little world. And they're, imagine the number of people in your day-to-day -day life that feel totally invisible. The woman at the cash register. All of, the, all of these big companies are moving away from self-checkout back to normal checkout. This is good for us Christians, by the way. More opportunities for us to love people. Her name, all day long, people have just been mistreating this lady. They don't even know her name. But you can see her. Take note of her name. Ask her how her day is going. You never know where it might lead. Maybe you got a big family and she's going to be checking things out for like five, six minutes. Five, six minutes of uninterrupted you loving that person time. Maybe you'll get the opportunity to share the gospel in that short amount of time. I uh, had a friend who I'd, I worked for, actually, and uh, his name was Pastor Scott. And Pastor Scott, I would greet him every day. I would say, hey, Pastor Scott, it's good to see you. And Pastor Scott would reply to me, it's good to be seen. And as a young 19-year-old that I was, I always felt like that was just the strangest way to respond to me in light of the fact that the normal way to respond to that would be, well, it's good to see you too, Nathan. I'm like, is it not good to see me? <laughs> but he said, it's good to be seen. And that just perplexed me for so long. Like, what do you mean? It's fine. I'm like, you're a pastor. People see you all the time. And finally, I realized, no, they don't. They look at him all the time. But they don't see him. For many, he's just the pastor. He's the fancy guy who stands on the stage and preaches God's word. 
But very few people get the t- take the time to know him as a human being. He knows what it's like to feel invisible. So Jesus sees people. The second thing Jesus does is he stops. Imagine the story of Zacchaeus. If Jesus had seen him in the tree and been like, that's weird, let's go. (laughs) Like, imagine the story. Zacchaeus' life would never have been changed or transformed. But because Jesus stopped, Zacchaeus' life was never the same. We're so busy, right? I get it. Americans, we, we, we have a badge called busy, and we wear it like, a, like it's honorable. We need to build time into our lives so that we can love the people around us and see and stop with them. I, re- I remember this one time I was driving through my city, and uh, I got to this uh, corner of, Miss, uh, it was Hamden and Kipling. I preached this message all over the world, and Um, I realized that you guys know what those roads are. So anyway, I was at Hamden and Kipling. And uh, as I was there, I saw a man flying a sign, God bless, anything helps, please, that sign. And uh, the the words of Jesus in in the scriptures, love love the least of these, were playing through my head so loud that I I, I was like, "I, I know I'm supposed to stop. But I didn't. Instead, I thought to myself, you know, I have an important meeting at church to get to. I actually was driving to church, and I actually did have an important meeting at church. But you guys see the hypocrisy of that? That's ridiculous. I'm going to my important meeting at church, but I'm not willing to love the person on the side of the road. That's a problem. Anyway, I drive like a quarter mile. Again, like this overwhelming sense of those words, of the the biblical words in my mind, like I have to do this. No, I don't have time. Keep going. I am all the way to, if you guys know the streets, Kipling and Jewel. So I've gone like two, three miles at this point. And finally, I'm like, all right, I'll turn around. So I turn around, drive all the way back. I park my car. I'm walking up to this guy and I'm shaking because I'm so nervous to talk to him. And I'm like, I don't even know what to say. So I reach my hand out. I say, hey, my name is Nathan, what's yours? He says, my name's Walt. I say, hey, Walt, how's your day going? He says, terrible. But he didn't use the word terrible. He used a bunch of cuss words. I won't share those with you. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear that, Walt. What can I do for you? Well, I haven't eaten today. Hey, I have some food. Let me go grab that for you. So I go grab my lunch. Hey, man, I know it's not very much, but here, I want you to have this. Oh, thanks so much. Is there anything else I can do for you? Well, my back's been hurting. I was in the military, and uh, it just hurts and hurts. And I'm, man, I'm so sorry. Can I pray for you? Sure. So I pray for him. So kind of a, like a five-minute time, and then I get in my car and go back. And over the course of the next few months, I begin to store socks and food in my car specifically for when I see Walt. Because every time I see him, I want to take time to just be with him for a few minutes. So I make it a practice to pull my car over and go out and have a conversation with Walt. Several months go by, and finally, after many months of of, of repeatedly sharing the gospel with him and loving him and doing all these things for him, guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. Walt still has not decided to follow Jesus, unfortunately. And my heart breaks and I pray for him But I tell you that story because you're going to encounter those kinds of things all the time. Fear of rejection cannot be a good reason for us to not share the love of Jesus with people. What a, a, like, just logically speaking, what a really bizarre thing that we wouldn't share Jesus with somebody because we're afraid of them rejecting him. I really encourage you, next time you have one of these opportunities, seize it. You you might be saying, well, what if God doesn't want me to speak to this person at this moment? What are you talking about? It's right here. He said it 2,000 years ago. You don't need a specific invitation from Jesus every time to talk to somebody about him. It's unnecessary. He already said it. He already made it clear. This is something he's asking all of us to do. 
The third thing that Jesus does is he spends time with Zacchaeus. Sees, stops, and spends time with. Is that very complicated? Hopefully not. I mean, we all speak English, so Lord willing, that is not a complicated sentence. Is it challenging? Does it come at a cost? Yeah, sure, I get that. But it's not complicated. Next time you're reading through the Gospels, I challenge you to look for these three things. You'll notice that Jesus does them over and over and over and over again. Jesus' model of ministry is that when, the, when blind Bartimaeus calls out to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's, Shh. Jesus is like, no, 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 we're stopping. What can I do for you? When the, remember, when Jesus gets touched by the, the, the woman on the hem of his cloak, the woman with the blood flow, do you remember where he was headed? He was going to go heal a dying girl. You think he wasn't urgent? That was a 911. 911. And yet still, Jesus stops. Who touched me? This is Jesus' model of ministry. Not from a stage. Yeah, of course he preaches from a stage. It says he was going through all the towns and villages preaching in their synagogues. Yeah, he preaches from a stage. But it's up close. It's nearby. It's one life at a time. And I want to just leave you with these words. You guys remember that number? 3.3 billion people on planet Earth today who don't know Jesus. It would take me 6,300 years to preach to all of them just one time. You guys remember that number? What if we work together? What if instead of me being the only one to share the gospel with people, what if we all decided to do this together? And little by little, just tried to reach the world. Let's just do an experiment with, really quickly, bear with me. I'm, Ed, I'm so sorry again, man. All right. So, year, let's just do it by years. You could also do this by months or weeks, but we'll do it by years. Year one, I'm going to lead just one person to Christ. So, tag, stand up, please. Thank you, thank you. What's your name, by the way? Tyler. Tyler, nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. All right, cool. So, I lead Tyler to Christ. Congratulations, welcome to the family of God. And I disciple Tyler. I teach him, here's how you love people, here's how you read the Bible. All right, now it's your turn to go share the gospel with somebody else. So you tag somebody and I'm gonna go tag somebody else. All right, tag somebody, Tyler. All right, okay. So I'm gonna tag this gentleman here. All right, go ahead and stand up. Thank you, thank you. All right, so two years have passed. I only have four, con- we only have four converts in our movement. It's kind of tiny. If I had preached to 10,000 people per week for two years, I would have a lot more people, but let's just keep, let's see how it goes. All right. So year three, let's tag again. Year three, let's tag again. All right. Go ahead. Tag somebody, please. Tag somebody. All right. There we go. Nice work. Okay. We have eight. We've doubled. By the way, this is really important. I've only led three people to Christ, and I'm only discipling three people. You people, each person who's led somebody to Christ, like this, I'm not, I'm not discipling this gentleman. This gentleman is discipling this gentleman, not me. All right? Okay. Let's go. All right. You tag your it, tag somebody, tag somebody, tag somebody. All right. Great, great, great. All right. Our movement is growing. All right. 16. All right. Tag somebody again. All right. Oh, man, I can't believe I'm running in church. All right. All right. 32, tags again. All right, tag your eight. All right. 64, tag again. I think this will cover everybody. All right. Okay, everybody go ahead and stand up. The whole room has been reached for Christ. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. We're so happy to have you here. All right, you can be seated. Uh, When I was in eighth grade, my uh, teacher presented me with this dilemma. She said, 
Would you want $100,000 now or one penny doubled for 30 days? Anybody know the right answer? A penny doubled for 30 days. Same concept here. It will not take us 100 years to reach the entire population of planet Earth with the gospel if we did it this way. Just remember, this is just one person at a time. One person at a time. It wouldn't take us 50. In 34 years, we would have enough spiritual generations to cover all 8 billion people and more in 34 years. Now, I understand there's going to be people who hear the gospel and reject it, and that throws a kink into the numbers. But you guys understand. You understand the power of just one life at a time. Remember your favorite story of Jesus? Is it just one life? Jesus understood the value of just one life. Don't think, well, you know, I'm just not cut out for this because I can't stand on a stage. I don't know the right word. That, it's just not true. You are cut out for this. Do you got Jesus? Do you know the gospel? You've got what you need. So this is what laborers do. A laborer is an ordinary person who loves God, who loves others, who advances his mission, whatever that might look like, loving others every day, every place. At the market, King Supers, at work, at school. You know how many unreached kids are in our schools today? Oh. They see, they stop, they spend time. They don't do it 100 lives at a time or 50, just one to one. Just like Jesus, over and over and over again. In all the normal places, at all the normal times. People tell me, I don't have time. I say, me neither. What if we just paused with the people who were right in front of us? What if we gave them an extra two or three minutes? Everybody's got time for that. Brothers and sisters, I hope that this does not come off as a guilt trip. <laughs> I hope that this comes off as an invitation to the epic adventure of seeing the book of Acts played out in front of your very eyes every day, every place you go seeing the living God step into the lives of people and change them from the inside out in ways that you could never imagine. Just because you simply choose to love people, see them, spend a little time with them, share the good news. Father God, we praise you. You are holy and good. Lord, I pray that you would call on us. Father, that we wouldn't be like Isaiah who says, or sorry, that we wouldn't be like Moses who says, send somebody else, but that we'd be like Isaiah who says, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, I pray that what you're doing in this room right now would have ripple effects, not just here in our city, but we do desperately need Jesus here in this city, but that it would have ripple effects even to other places around the world. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would transform hearts and transform minds and transform lives. And that we would get to see it happen. Lord, that leading somebody to Christ wouldn't be some pipe dream of, of 90% of us who have never done that before according to statistics, but that it would be something that all of us could experience the joy of. Lord, open hearts, open minds out there of the people that we're going to come into contact with. Help us to, to meet the right people at the right time and, and share the love of Jesus and the message of Jesus at the right place at the right time. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you're out there and you're saying, you know what? I can be a laborer. Uh, would you mind raising your hand for me? Hallelujah. Praise God.
Hallelujah. Here's my encouragement. It's all fun and games in here. Yay, we're excited. Let's go do it. And then you walk out those doors and it's like, <laughs> fear, instant. Here's my encouragement. Abide in the vine. This is where you get the courage. This is where you get the words. This is where you get what you need in order to pour out to others. Spend time with him. Jesus, please give us courage. Watch, just watch. God will do incredible things that you could never have imagined. And it's not because you're special. It's because he is so good.